Hello, everyone. Just last week, on the full moon of the Tamil month of Thai, millions of Hindus around the world gathered together to celebrate the Thai Pusam festival. During this festival, devotees will build large bamboo structures called Kavadi. This word literally means burden. And indeed, some of these structures can weigh over 40 or 50 kilos. And during the course of this ritual, for the entire day, they will carry these structures on the shoulders until they reach the temple of Muruga, many hours later. But before they do, they will have their body pierced with sharp objects. And these objects can range from a single needle through the cheeks and tongue to hundreds of needles throughout the torso, the back, the arms, and the legs. And if you're feeling squeamish at this point, there's more. Because some of them will have rods and skewers and even things like umbrellas pierced through their cheeks. Or hooks attached to their bodies by which they drag large chariots the size of minivans. And they do this for the entire day. Some of them will walk on shoes made of nails. But the alternative is not very pleasant either, because that involves walking barefooted on the burning asphalt in the midsummer tropical sun, where for a city dweller like myself, it is utterly impossible to take a single step on that asphalt without my shoes on. Anthropologists have called these rituals rites of terror, especially when referring to some initiation rituals that mark the passage into adulthood. And this passage can be more than symbolic. It can often be very real, because in some societies, these individuals have no option but to undergo this painful ordeal, because otherwise they have no place in that society. But in many other cases, like the Kavadi ritual, these ordeals are performed entirely voluntarily. And from an evolutionary perspective, this behavior is very puzzling because it entails very high costs and very high risks, but no immediately obvious benefits. So why would somebody do this voluntarily? To answer this question, I've embarked on a journey around the world, studying some of the world's most extreme rituals, living with local communities, and combining anthropology, science, and technology to investigate their effects on individuals and on societies. And my findings reveal that these rituals persist before they satisfy, they serve some fundamental human needs, and they serve important functions for the individuals and for the groups involved. In a small Spanish village called San Pedro Manrique in Soria, the locals will gather every June to perform a fire-walking ritual. They build a large fire made of oak wood, which produces a very high temperature and then will be reduced to a bed of glowing red coals. We measure the surface temperature in those coals at 700 degrees Celsius, over 1200 Fahrenheit. And then, at exactly midnight on the summer solstice, one of the hottest days of the year, they will take off their shoes, they will carry someone on their back, and they will work barefooted across the burning coals. This ritual is extremely important to these people. I remember reading an interview by the local mayor in a newspaper, and he said, I've been the mayor for 22 years, but tonight is the most important night of my career. Not just because I get to organize the festival for the last time, but because this night I get to carry my daughter through the fire. And indeed, he did so, and when the ritual was over, the entire family gathered together, they hugged, and they cried tears of joy and pride. So this ritual is extremely important for these people. It's the largest event, the most important event in this village throughout the year. But when I did what anthropologists do, asking people why they perform these rituals, the most common answer is, I don't know, that's what we do. Our fathers have done this, our grandfathers have done this, and their grandfathers before them. So this is just our tradition. But they also refer to a sense of identity. These rituals are fundamental to their personal and their collective identity. 
Without this fire walking ritual, we wouldn't be who we are. San Pedro, our village, would never be San Pedro without this tradition. And anthropologists have known this effect of ritual in building identities for many years. Emil Durkheim described a phenomenon that he called collective effervescence, an ecstatic feeling of excitement and togetherness that people feel when they get together to perform highly arousing events. And at some level, we've all felt this feeling, whether uh, when dancing on the dance floor with others or chanting in a football stadium with 30,000 people who share the same ideology as we do. But how can we measure this collective effervescence? How do we define even this vague concept? And how can we measure togetherness? In a study that my team and I conducted at this village, we used heart rate monitors to measure people's physiological responses to this ritual. And what we found was that there was an astonishing degree of synchronicity in their heart rates, although their bodies were doing entirely different things. These people are not performing the firework at the same time. While some of them are walking on fire, others are sitting down, standing up, or merely watching. We found that there was a, a tremendous degree of emotional alignment among community members, which extended beyond the active performers, even to the spectators who were merely watching. So for the first time, we were able to measure collective effervescence. We were able to measure this togetherness literally in people's hearts. But how does this actually translate into behavior? In the Kabaddi ritual of Mauritius, devotees engage in these painful activities all day until they reach the Temple of Murugan. And then they will have to carry their burden 242 steps up the hill to offer it to the Lord Murugan. So we wanted to examine how this ritual would affect pro-social behaviors by looking at how much money people were willing to donate at a charity after performing this ritual compared to other rituals. So after their participation in different types of rituals, we invited these people to fill out some questionnaires discussing their experience about how painful this ritual was. And at the end of those questionnaires, we thanked them for participating. We paid them 200 rupees. And we told them they were free to go. 200 rupees in this context is a substantial amount of money. It's about three days salary of an unskilled worker. And a few meters later, somebody stopped them, a local assistant, and asked them if they were willing to make a donation to a local charity. So we took those donations as a measure of pro-social behavior. And we saw that after performing a collective prayer, which is a low-key, more mundane ritual, people were significantly more likely to make a donation to this charity. But after taking part in the painful ritual, they were three times more likely to donate money. And this effect extended beyond the active participants. It even extended to the observers. Family members who had just walked along the procession but had no piercings, were carrying no cavities, were not barefooted, and felt no pain. And when we look only at those who experience the painful sensations, we see a direct correlation between the level of pain and the amount they donated. The more pain they felt during the ritual, the more money they gave to charity. In other studies, we're also finding that these rituals, despite the pain that they involve, can have positive psychological effects. In an ecstatic ritual in the island of Mauritius, we measured people's physical and psychological reactions to this ordeal, which involves walking on burning coals as well as on the edges of knives. And we found that the more exhausted their bodies seemed to be, the more they suffered, the less tired and more euphoric they felt. This is similar to what marathon runners report after having suffered for a prolonged period of time. This endorphin-mediated effect, the feeling of euphoria that we know as the runner's high. And in another study, we looked at the long-term health effects of those rituals. Over a period of two months, we followed participants and we monitored them on a physical and psychological level. 
We used portable devices that measured the electrical conductivity of their skin, their activity levels, the sleeping patterns, their body temperature. We got measurements of their blood pressure, and so on. Participants wore those devices 24-7. And on the day of the ritual, it was often hard to find a patch of skin that was two inches wide here that was free of needles. So what we find is that on a typical day in their lives, their stress levels, as measured by their galvanic skin response, look like this. On the day of the ritual, they look like this. Their stress levels are orders of magnitude higher. This is an extremely stressful experience. But just a few days later, stress levels are even lower than before. And indeed, their quality of life and their psychological well-being has significantly increased. And most importantly, the more they suffer during the ritual, the better their psychological health later. But of course, those rituals are extreme. They're outliers. What about more mundane ritual practices that don't involve any pain or bodily harm? Over a century, or about a century ago, anthropologist Bronislav Malinowski established a link, or proposed a link, between ritual and anxiety. He noticed that the people of the Trobriand Islands, where he was doing his fieldwork in the South Pacific, were much more likely to engage in rituals before going out in the open sea to fish, where they had to battle the big waves and the small canoes and the sharks, and there was a lot of uncertainty. You never knew if you were going to bring something back or if you were going to come back. So they would perform a lot of rituals before going out in the open sea, but not before going out to fish in the lagoon, where they had to face calm waters and pretty much a certain catch. So Malinowski proposed that there's a link between ritual and anxiety. And in our laboratory studies, we're finding that there is indeed this link between stress and ritualized behavior. In a study led by my PhD students, we used motion detectors to see how people respond to stress. So we brought people into the lab, and we stressed them up. And you know what the best way to stress somebody is? Have them talk in front of an audience. So we brought people in, and we told them they would have three minutes to perform, to prepare a speech that we're going to deliver in front of a panel of experts. And that really freaked them out. And we measured this in their heart rates, so we know it works. And then we use our motion detectors to monitor their hand gestures. And we see that the more stressed they get, the more repetitive, rigid, and redundant their hand movements become. In other words, the more stressed they get, the more ritualized their behavior. And this is because when we're dealing with chaos and uncertainty and unpredictability, engaging in these highly predictable, repetitive actions provides a sense of control over the situation, which in fact is an unpredictable situation and has high uncertainty. And that is why you see the speakers at this conference pace up and down as they talk to you. That is also why ritual and superstition tend to be particularly present in specific situations that involve stress and uncertainty, like gambling. If you want to observe superstitious behaviors, go to a casino. Or sports. Athletes are well known for their pre-game rituals. Or war. Anthropologists know that in times of conflict, people perform more rituals. Other studies have actually showed that baseball players who perform rituals can increase their performance. That does not happen through any metaphysical or magical way. What psychologists are finding is that the mediating factor there is confidence. Performing these rituals increases confidence, removes stress, which allows you to play better if you believe in it. And more recent studies have found that performing a short ritual before eating a piece of chocolate or even carrot or even broccoli can make your food taste better. So rituals are very powerful technologies of the mind. And as all such psychological techniques, they can be used for better or for worse. In a study we performed at the Laboratory for the Experimental Research of Religion in the Czech Republic, 
we found that the same high arousal ritual could lead to very different outcomes in terms of people's behavior. In this study led by Professor Radek Kunt, we had people engage in a highly arousing ritual which got their heart rates racing. And then we manipulated the context. We had them play video games that primed them with either pro-sociality or anti-sociality. And then we saw how likely they were to help another human being who asked them for help. And we see that when we couple the ritual with a pro-social prime, the higher the arousal, the more likely they are to help somebody. But when we couple the ritual with an anti-social prime, the higher the arousal, the less likely they are to help somebody. So the same ritual actions could turn people into angels or demons, depending on their context. This power of ritual to influence our actions is something we have known at some level for a very long time. And this is why we see rituals used by religions, fraternities, sports, militaries, even corporations, to bring people together and increase social cohesion, but also to pitch them against each other by fueling nationalism and exclusion. From the first time our ancestors gathered around the fire to perform their rituals, whether consciously or unconsciously, we have learned to harness the power of ritual. When we raise our glasses to propose a toast, when we sing happy birthday at a party, we do it because, well, we just do it, because that's what we do. But we also do it because it brings us closer to each other. And when we kiss our lucky charm before an important exam, we do it because it makes us feel better, and helps us relax. And although these things have no direct influence over the physical world, they can transform our inner world, and they can have a major impact on our social world. So by understanding the ways in which this happens, we gain a better understanding of ourselves and a very important part of what it is that makes us human. Thank you very much. <laughs>